go right into questions. So go ahead and raise your hand and get started. Start with Grant here in the end, then Jimmy. Jimmy, how'd, how'd you get that boo boo? I, I forgot to take the trash out. My wife was upset. She hit you with a bat or just what she hit you with? With a bat. Yeah. I was saying the thing though. I like the way you cut your hair over, too. That's pretty good. <laughs> That's impressive. It's a wig. Yeah. Rick, when you, you look back at this team, what do you think uh, the legacy will be that people remember? Well, looking at it from the inside out, it's the way that they really, um, I think, respected each other and had the utmost respect in terms of holding each other accountable. You could almost feel it, uh, you know, right after really at, at the end of January where uh, just – it really started coming together, and it was when they really held each other accountable at a, at a very high level. And it was not just in games, but it was in practice every day. And uh, but uh, it was uh, a special group of guys, it really was. And, and and so many guys, even the guys that weren't that uh, didn't play, I think taught their teammates a lot of uh, life lessons in the way. Again, I've said it many times: the way VJ Bailey handled the situation and. Other guys on the team, I could go through each one of them. Just the way they, they handled it was really remarkable. And uh, because I think they've truly sold out for each other as a team. Rick, what will you miss most without Kennedy Chandler? And what does B.J. Edwards bring to the table? Well, you know, B.J.'s – certainly we think he's got a terrific future ahead of him. You know, he, he's, he does uh, have a, feel, a really good feel for the game. He, he understands how to play basketball. Uh, like all freshmen coming in, he's going to have to get him – his body in the kind of shape he needs to to compete at this level. He'll continue to, not one part of his game does he not have to improve on, but I would, I said the same thing about Kennedy Chandler and those guys a year ago, but uh, we're excited about him because we do think that he gives us some versatility at, uh, he could really play anywhere the three perimeter spots on the court. And, and without Kennedy Chandler? Well, you know, Kennedy was responsible for like, what, 30 some percent of our offense, something like that. And, uh, but you know, uh, we, we've got, uh, you know, obviously the majority of the guys back that played a lot of minutes, and we're, we'll continue to recruit up until, you know, we get ready to, you know, shut that part of it down. But Kennedy, uh, I thought really uh, the best compliment I could give Kennedy is how he kept wanting to get better. It took him a little bit of time to adjust to the game, which you would expect it to at the collegiate level, not just uh, practice, but the grind that goes into it. But uh, – once he turned the corner, he uh, came in every day. And, I, and I've said it all year to you guys that what Santi and, and Zakai did for Kennedy and what they all did for each other was really the reason we got such good play from all three of those guys all year. Rick, you guys have two openings right now. Do you have a plan positionally for how you'd like to address those openings? And, and what are the needs right now that you may see on this roster moving forward? Well, I think our biggest needs is we, we like to get the very best players that we can get that we think will help us. Uh, and we want versatility, but we, we really do. Like, we want as many guys that can play as many different positions as, as they possibly can. We want we want all the intangibles that you talk about that comes with, you know, that we talk about the DNA of certain players. We, we want to continue to – we think we can get better defensively. We think that uh, we know that we want to – uh, the biggest improvement that we still think will come from within our program, our players in our program right now. But uh, we're looking at a number of different guys, and uh, we're excited about them. Uh, but we'll wait and see how that fall shakes out. Any other questions? Go to Rob and Ben. Coach, you guys have had a great track record for player development since, since you got here. How big of an offseason is this for Brandon and, and Jonas in particular? I think it's really huge for those guys. I think it's for, for all of them. You know, we, we started back on Tuesday. We gave gave them some time. Obviously, there was uh, some wear and tear on guys that we needed to let them get their bodies back. And now we're easing back into it. And uh, but it's, even with, with, as I say that to you, there was a lot of guys that, as soon as we were finished, they came right back into the gym on their own a lot at night, doing what they needed to be doing. And but it's critical. I mean, um, you know, if you're not getting better, you're getting worse because the people around you, you, you have to believe we're going to continue to get better. But we need Brandon and, and uh, Jonas to uh, – Urosh, uh, Olivier getting back, uh, Josiah, Santi, Zakai, all of them. Uh, you know, Jemai, there's not one of them that we don't need to continue to get better. And um, 
with that said, it's, we want to continue along with what we, the leadership that we were able to develop this year, we want to see that go to a, another level too. Rick, just with Justin, what does he need to do specifically to find more playing time next year? Because most of those guards are, are still back aside from Kennedy. Well, again, we, we saw Justin at times, you know, do some really good things. And uh, consistency is it's what it's going to be uh, every day, understanding that uh, what goes into it and, and doing the things. And, he's, and he really does a lot of things really, really well. And I think what he's going to have to do, and he's doing it now, I think he understands he's got to take what he does well and become great with it. And uh, I think that he, again, um, we're, we're excited about what he can bring us because uh, he showed at times this year that he could really make a difference. Vincent Ryan. Rick, two things. You mentioned a number of times that anyone on your roster has the ability to move on now with the transfer portal world the way it is. How do you handle that as a coach? Do you have ongoing conversations as the year goes on? Do you have a specific meeting? How, how do you handle that aspect of kids being able to bolt at any time? Well, we do. At the end of the year, we have our, uh, the, uh, you know, we sit down as a staff and we, you know, we've been doing it forever. But uh, I'll really have the assistant coaches meet with the guys first. And because I just feel like they're going to uh, be a little bit more truthful, I guess, during that meeting at that time, because we try to do it as soon as the season's over with, just to get their feel on a lot of different things. But Vince, I will tell you, we're on top of it all year, you know, and, and, and the thing bad about the transfer portal where it's out of line, I mean, there, there's more tampering going on in college basketball now than it's ever been before. I mean, guys recruit, uh, you know, I kidded, uh, I kid all the time about, you know, everybody talks about uh, uh, taking out the handshake line. I said, well, maybe not. That might be the best way we can recruit. You know, walking through the line and saying, hey, you look good in orange, you know. I mean, uh, I'm just it, – but just, it goes on. I mean, I could – I mean, right now you hear stories where teams have been recruiting guys all year. And that's, that's, the, that's the really tough part about it. But with that said, to answer your question, we're not na uh, naive to it. So all year long, and uh, when you're dealing with young people, there aren't a lot of secrets because somebody's always going to talk. And you can – but you've got to be in a position that – and it goes back to when I talk about our assistant coaches, you know, with their experience and what they do, you know, they, they, they know what we know what's going on. And there's nothing that's going on around our program with our players that, that we don't have a pretty good feel for it. But it's not just at the end of the year, it's it's the stuff you do. I, I mean, this year I've said it, we, we had a this was a really a special group of guys, but it wasn't perfect. I mean, we, we went through times this year where we were uh, you know, having to deal with issues and, and that, that go on that, that uh, it's not, most of the time it's not the players, it's outside sources that, that are in their ears. And that's what you've got to be aware of that we can't control that. We can only control that what goes on within our locker room. And I think the only way you can control is when you hear it, you got to hit it just uh, right in the face. You got to go right at it. And, uh, and so we, we try to do that as much as we can. And second question, what do you see as a future? For Quentin Dublin Jr. You know, Quentin's got a decision to make, and uh, you know he uh, Quentin wants to play. And with that said, we've had some some talks about it with him, and uh, and you know there is a possibility that he's going to leave. Which uh, I think if he does, I think that he will end up going to East Carolina with Coach Schwartz because Coach is going to hire a, a great friend of ours from France that uh, it really helped us recruit Eve. Quentin and, and some other guys, but uh, uh, and, and I, we all really respect Quentin a great deal. But you know, he looks at our roster right now, and, and he feels like for him to to grow. But uh, I, I think that's that's what's going to happen. To be quite honest with you, and uh, but um, it hasn't become he, uh, an official, but uh, it, it's going to happen. Take the lead on non conference scheduling, or will that kind of be a team effort? No, that, you know, uh, you know, Coach Polinski was here with us all year, and knowing that uh, if Mike had, had an opportunity, he had some opportunities a year ago, that uh, he would roll into that. So all year he's been doing a lot with, with Mike and, and that role with uh, not just with Mike, but, you know, Mary Carter and Garrett are really, really important in our day-to-day -day operations with our schedule and, and with, with what goes on. You know, Mary Carter and 
and Garrett are on top of everything on a day-to-day -day basis more than any of our assistant coaches. But uh, in terms of scheduling and and uh, and when they you know sit down and look at it, obviously they're going to put it in front of me. And but uh, but yeah, we uh, Greg is 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 on top of that. But but all the coaches are like this time of year, like looking to fill out your schedule. They're all if there's contact somewhere, they'll they'll call and ask about possible games and. You know we're we're uh, in in contact right now with some uh, really good teams uh, that I think our fans will be excited about. But but it's so hard putting it all together from both. I mean scheduling is really difficult because of uh, you know we don't care oftentimes where we start, but we're trying to balance it uh, with 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 uh, like our for instance the Wisconsin game. You know that's that's been put off for the last couple of years. Uh, because it just wasn't the right time for them, and it wasn't the right time for us. And when you and when you deal with people like Wisconsin, they're great about you know let's you know they're not trying to just manipulate it to work for them. We're not trying to manipulate it to work for us. We're just trying to do the right thing for both both parties to get it done. And the scheduling it's an art to scheduling, and it's really really difficult. But uh, I would say to answer your question, all the coaches, uh, you know, we're, we're always uh, in our. Uh, Special assistants are always on the phone calling people about games. Hey, Coach Barnes. Santiago Vescovi said that you encouraged him to go through the NBA draft evaluation process. What was that conversation like, and how beneficial will that be for him? Who did you say? I didn't. Santiago Vescovi. Well, I think it's important for all of them, and, and I think they, you know, they have that opportunity to do that. And I think that when the time comes where they feel like they're ready to do that, I think they they need to do it. I do because a year from now. Uh, you know, Santi's going to have a lot of different options that he can do. Uh, it, it's like a, a test run for him, where they can get there, get get feedback. I, I would say that uh, there's not a program in the country that has has a, a real advantage like we do with Coach Polinski being here, because he spent 23 years, so he he's able to spend a lot of time talking to what what that's going to be about, what it's going to, what what what's important there. But with that said, they need to go through it. They need to sit there and. You know, go through the interview. They need to hear the feedback, and uh, so a year from now, when it's when it's time, when it's time, that they're they're so much more comfortable with it. But we would always encourage those guys to take advantage of that rule. Coach, back here again. Mm -hmm. uh, going back a few weeks ago, you go from winning the SEC tournament championship to then losing in your season ending in almost a week. Just how did you navigate that emotionally as a head coach, and, and how you coached your team? You know it's really hard when when uh, when the season comes to and, and you know it when you've been doing it as long as I have it's going to either only one team's going to be really truly static. I, I'm, I've said it before. You lose in the championship game, semifinal game. You lose. It's such a sudden halt that uh, it's tough, especially when uh, you have high expectations when you when you want it all. And uh, so it, it it does leave a, a bitter taste in your mouth. And when I got home that night, or whenever it was, I can't remember exactly. I, I didn't go to bed. You know, I came in. I, I uh, six o'clock in the morning. I was still awake. And uh, but then, as time goes on, like when uh, you look back and you think about this team and, and uh, the fact that uh, we had half the team was freshmen and the way they came together with with the older guys, and you look back on it. The fact we never lost back-to-back -back games, uh, winning an SEC championship is something that will th – this group of guys will always – I mean, they will be teammates forever, forever. And, uh, and, the, and the way they really embraced each other, uh, yeah, you look at that. But – and I've said before, you don't ever take for granted getting to the NCAA tournament. I've been in it a, a lot of times. But if you don't get it all – and I'm going to tell you, uh, I promise you right now, if Hubert Davis could be, would be standing here right now, he would tell you the same thing I'm telling you. It's a bitter pill to swallow when you don't feel like you, you, you got it done the way that you're, you're hoping to get it done. And uh, But you know what? Then you look back and you look at our team and some of the, the great things that they did. But, uh, but that also motivates you going forward. That again, now we've got to get back to that tournament, and then you get in it. Now you got to want it. Uh, you want to go further with it, and uh, see how far you you can go with it. And as you notice this year with different teams like a, a St. Pete, I mean those those teams uh, get in the tournament. Uh, 
you know, they, they catch, you know, lightning in a bottle, they can get going. And, and uh, it, it's, a, it's a different game when you get there. And what you really hope is that everything, you, you play well, you hope your best players, you, all your players are ready to get it done on a night in and night out basis. But that one game comes down to it where can we be at our best right now? And you hope to build that. But uh, looking back again, there's so many things with this group of guys that, that – uh, and again, the, the wins and all that were great, but it was watching them grow as a team. And uh, we, we went into the year telling them that we haven't had the kind of leadership from the players that we needed. And uh, that's how we ended last year. We started out last uh, summer with the same meeting about where's the leadership going to come from. And we, we had it. It was great during the summer. Then we went through some laws there. Then we had another team meeting to talk about it again. Like, you know, this is it. Now, now we're getting into it. How, how are we going to continue to build on this leadership and, and watching our guys really do it and watching them coach each other, hold each other accountable. It, it was, it, that's to me is what I will, will remember about this team. And, and I said it to the team we got back. Every year as coaches, you know, you want, you want to, uh, there's a connection I think you get with uh, a team and coaches. Sometimes you don't feel like you ever get in totally with your players. And I, I told our guys, from a coach's standpoint, the best thing was how they let us in, totally let us in. And uh, that, was, that was special because they – and what I'm talking about is where they would come to me, whether it would be Josiah, Santi, uh, Uros, you, you name it, uh, V.J. Bailey, like say, hey, coach, you need, we, we need to be thinking about this. And um, that's what, again, with this team is what I will most re remember. Rick, I know that sort of everything with the portal now, it's just sort of the way things are. but. It may have been, uh, I think LSU, Murray State, maybe a couple other places where recently there were zero active players on the entire roster. And I know you, you're going to have a few guys leave. Everybody else will. As a coach, how do you not let that drive you sort of crazy or, or to paranoia thinking about I'm going to be stuck here at some point, maybe and hardly have a team? Well, I think you, we accept where it is and what it is. You know, and, and uh, I think you embrace the portal. I do. I think you've got to realize that it can work both ways too. You know, that uh, sometimes it's, it might be the right thing for a player to go in it. But I've always said this in recruiting, there's enough players out there for all of us. It really is. The hard part is, and I can tell you, we, we've done a lot of talking to teams that last year that uh, went primarily through the portal, and they weren't very happy with it. They just feel like what I just talked about, the chemistry and all that. So I think there's a balance you got to have. But what you're talking about is when you lose them all and then everybody comes in at one time, it's almost like you're starting over in terms of uh, – and that's what you don't want to do if you can help it. You want to – you know, your core players will be guys that have – that understand your system, that can continue to build and grow that way. But uh, I do think that where we are in today's world with basketball, you, you have to embrace the portal, knowing that uh, – uh, it's a little bit different than a year ago. Last year we were able, I think players had up until July the 1st, right? It's something like that. And this year I think it ends May 1st. May 1st. So that's, that's a big difference. I mean, wait until July to put your team together or, or wonder, like you were just saying, you know, what's going to happen between now and July? Because we all know that there's, there's people out there that's going to continue to recruit uh, players, or try to recruit players away from programs, ours included. And, so we have to, uh, but I think moving that uh, up till May 1st is, is much better for all of us. Jimmy, the mic. I've got a couple of things. Uh, Josiah Jordan James, do you expect him to test the NBA waters? Yeah, I, I think, again, I think it's good for him. I, th I, I do. Uh, I do think, I, I think uh, he'll, he'll, he'll do that. Uh, you know, he, Joe is a very methodical, well thought out person and when, uh, and he'll do it based on how he feels, you know, when he decides he wants to announce whether he's going to do it or not, you know. Second, what is the key to making a long run in the NCAA tournament? Well, uh, you know what, Jimmy, I think if you ask anybody that, there's a lot of things you can talk about, the ifs, ands, and buts about it. But I think if, uh, there's no question talent is very important, you know, leadership, all the things that we talk about as a team is important. Matchups are important, you know. Uh, you know, I'll, like I will tell you, I, I watched the uh, Connecticut women play North Carolina State, 
in, in Bridgeport to go uh, to the Final Four, which a number one seed's having to play a number two seed basically in her backyard. And I said, I didn't think that was right. But then I thought back when we went to the Final Four, we got to play in San Antonio. So, and if you don't think that's an advantage, it isn't an advantage. It, it, it is, because I can remember we had 36,000 Texas fans in, in the San Antonio that day. And, uh, and uh, so it is, it is it's, it's big, obviously. But uh, so there's a lot of things that go in it. But then you, you know your players, uh, you, you know, at that point in time, we, we, we're going to go through if, if you go in and start, and I, I made this mistake at, at times uh, earlier where you, you make it bigger than it is because they already know it's big. I mean, that's what they've played for. You can put undue pressure on your players. And so, uh, and again, through the years, talking to a lot of different coaches through many years, you, you want to try to keep it as close to what you've done in terms of their preparation that where you keep them in that, gro uh, that groove, that rhythm. And then uh, you go back to games, I mean, we all know it gets down. I mean, you go back to uh, the uh, semifinal game, North Carolina, that shot that Caleb Love made, that three, that's a, that's a huge play. I mean, and then the next day or two days later, you had a hard time making shots. And so it's basketball and, and, what, you, and what you really hope and, and uh, uh, that at that point in time when you're playing with all the variables you can put into it, you're just hoping you, your, your players are at their best. You hope as a coach you're at your best, and uh, and you you know you hope that. Uh, but it's difficult. It is. It's, it's to, to win it, and so teams that get there more often, uh, consistently, are the ones I think can learn from it, understanding that they uh, that they uh, just they're, they're able to really knock out all the outside noise because it, it changes, and you guys know it. You know when you get there, the excitement around it, which you want your players to em enjoy it. And I thought our guys handled it well this year. I really did. I thought that they were really, uh, you know, going into it a, a year ago. It was so different. And this year, going back, I just thought their focus overall was really good through the, through the whole, you know, the two games that we played. Rick, in the past, you chose to hire assistant coaches from outside of who's currently on your staff. Why did you choose this time to retain or I guess promote GP and make him that third staff? Well, I've known uh, Greg for a long time. You know, when I left Alabama in, I think, 86, he took my place. He had, he had actually left uh, Texas to come to come back to Alabama, was there, and then uh, left and went to uh, Georgia Southern four years, and then he spent 23 years in the NBA. And through that time, we uh, uh, obviously stayed in contact. And when he decided that he was uh, going to step away from the NBA a year ago, and uh, we were talking, and uh, I said, uh, here's what I think is going to happen. I said, you know, Mike Schwartz is a terrific coach. He's had opportunities to leave. I think next year he's going to have a great opportunity at some point in time to go somewhere. And uh, what I'd really like to have is someone that I can slide right in here that understands everything that I want from that position. And uh, he And he had opportunities to go to – three or four different places in the league at, as a paid assistant coach, and he chose to come here. And uh, I will tell you this, in his role, I'm not sure I've ever seen anybody be more effective in, in the way he came in. And, uh, but he understands people, he understands the game, but the way he connected with our players. And I remember at one point in time this year, I was talking when, when it was pretty obvious that, that Coach Schwartz was gonna leave. Joe, Cy, and I were together, and I said, uh, uh, you know what, Joe, I'm going to, you know, I brought Coach Polinski here to put him in that role. And he said, well, why wouldn't you? He said, he's the right guy for it. And uh, the way he's, again, the way he's already connected with our players. And and uh, so knowing that, and, and, it's, and believe me, it's a whole lot smoother right now than, it, than it's, than it's uh, and he, and he's, uh, he, he loves it, you know, uh, I mean, he, he's, he loves it, and uh, the, the, what he's already added. I mean, I, I can tell you this: you ask any coach on our staff, where he's already had a tremendous impact this past year was player evaluation. Uh, like for instance, one night we were just carrying on a conversation, and the question was asked a minute ago: What are we thinking in the portal? I was just talking to him: What if we go this way, this way, this way of the portal? What if we go this way, this way, this way of the portal? Next day, he said, "I've got three different uh, roster managements." That, that I put together last night. 
you know, and he looked at it strictly from, I mean, that's what you had to do in the NBA is roster management every year. So he, he's brought a wealth of experience that way. And uh, basketball-wise, he's a terrific basketball coach. You can't spend the time that he has spent in here uh, and uh, not know the game the way he does. And then, uh, but I, I look at my other coaches, you know, Coach Lance, Coach McDonald, guys like that. I mean, we've got a wealth of experience on our staff. And then, you know, this past year, Coach Ganey and Coach Clark, them coming in. Uh, again, I, I've said it before, I think I've got the best coaching staff in the country. And uh, I think all those guys get up every day. And, and when, I come, when they come in, they ask me, what, what do I expect? I said, I expect you, you to get out of bed every morning as if you're the head coach. And, you, and you, you get up every day like, what would I do to make this program better? If you think like a head coach, you can become a head coach. But you got to get up every single day thinking, okay, you know, and it's always, it always starts with the players. And uh, the best, the guys that uh, you're around that do, are able to do that every day are the ones that uh, I think the players obviously attach themselves to. Where's that? Where's that come from? Where's that? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Very good. You want me to ask again? Yeah. I know you're going to continue pushing P, but is that going to be your theme song, walkout song next year? You're going to go with a different. Track? The only the only lyric I know is pushing P. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, y you know what? Uh, I told the guys I don't know what uh, you know. I, I know keeping the pressure on, but we, you know all year long, if you if I, if I had a mic on the whole time, if you heard me say keep pushing pace. Maybe I should write a song about it because we kept talking about you know elite pace moving you know but pace keep pace you know pushing pace but uh, you know again it goes back I will tell you this I mean I, I love coaching basketball but the best part is being with those guys every day I mean there's nothing like being with a bunch of young guys that have great dreams and they want to be great they're young they're trying to learn but our locker room is 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 um, our all of our home away from home and being in there every day and sitting down with all the guys. It, it, it's, it's, it's just fun being around them. And uh, so what, whatever they're dealing with or whatever the, whatever's happening at the time, it'll probably become whatever they're doing. Because they'll, they'll try to educate me with it anyway. Coach, you just finished your seventh season. You've had five assistants leave and all five of those guys left for head coaching jobs. Do you hire guys with an eye? I mean, do you just have an eye for talent like that? Or is there some way you manage your people you think that sets them up to leave here and run their own program? You know, Rob, to tell you the truth, I've always said I'm going to hire people that I think are better than me. And I think the worst thing you can do is win, the same way with players, is you put them in a box. Like I, uh, uh, I tell each one, I want you to be who you are, or I wouldn't. And we, when we interview them, you know, we, we get a feel for them. And certainly in most situations, we, we, there's, a con, there's a connection there somewhere between people that are being within our family some way, somehow. Like, uh, I'll tell you, I don't know if I've hired a coach that I haven't spoken to Rob Lanier about, um, Frank Haith. Uh, you go down the line, you know, guys that we know, that I know, that have been in the business with me. And I've been fortunate that those guys have, uh, have you know, led me the right way. But when they get here, what I just said, I said, if you want to be a head coach, you got to think like a head coach. And the quicker you can do that, the better off you are. And, I mean, I'm uh, – and we and I and I really do try to talk to our. I've said before I'm not a big staff meeting guy because I think when you go in the room, you know, uh, it can get going in a way where some guys can really add something, but maybe they don't want to speak up the way uh, uh, thinking that hey, well this guy's been here longer than that. But what I've learned if I can talk to them individually and say hey, tell me what you're thinking, and then if I'm willing to listen, they really give you good advice. But uh, but I want them thinking like head coaches. I, I, I think that uh, they've got to understand, and, and I tell them all, you need to know, like uh, I, I would tell Justin Ganey, you need to know what goes into what, say, Mike Schwartz did with scheduling, what, what goes on there, what uh, Mary Carter does every single day, what Garrett does every single day, what goes on with their academic people. They need to understand what goes into uh, 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 a, a program. Like, you know, this year we've asked a couple of our coaches to interview for some other jobs, and. I've said there are certain jobs you need to really interview the person that's interviewing you and just find out the, the commitment that they have. Because uh, like, uh, like Mike, I, Mike and I have spoken every day since he's been gone and you know he'll have some questions. Riley Davis, who was here, who's on his staff, 
Jake Morton, when I was a, head, a first year head coach, my two top recruits when I became a head coach 35 years ago, my two main guys were Hubert Davis and Jake Morton. That was the two guys I've spent weeks with trying to get them to come to George Mason. And uh, he's on Mike's staff now. So we were talking last night at 1130 about some different things, about the, a lot, the, honestly, the transfer portal, what they were trying to do. and. But it's, it's, it's uh, believing in people, and, and I was fortunate. When I went to George Mason, Rob, uh, Joe Harrington said to me, you're going to see how you can, a program has to be built from the ground up. He allowed me to be a part of everything that he did, and that's what I've tried to do with all my assistant coaches, to give them a chance to see it from every possible angle you can see it with. Like, uh, they don't, uh, for instance, most, most of our guys, when they first get here, have no idea the impact that Mary Carter and Garrett and their hands on with our guys every day, every day, you know, they're, they're, and, and I will tell you, our players, if they have a question nine times out of 10 about something other than basketball, they're going to go to Mary Carter nine times, really probably 10 times out of 10, uh, because I mean, she's that important with our program. And so when Mike left, he actually hired a young lady that sat out front in, uh, in Thompson bowling, Jesse, who, how long has she been there, Mary Carter? And, she, and just walking by every single day saying, hey, Jesse, how you doing, talking to her? And he asked, Mike asked me one day, he said, what do you think about uh, hiring Jesse? I said, she'd be great. He said, but he said, after being around Mary Carter, I'd like to have a female in that spot. And he hired Jesse. And because uh, she had mentioned that one day she wanted to get into sports administration and, and do what Mary Carter does. And so there's so many things that go on behind the scenes that I don't think people realize, but it goes back to the coaches. If they want to be head coaches, they're going to have a chance here to experience every facet of it if they're smart and they take advantage of it. And those guys, and I would say, Rob, those guys that have left, they did that. They really did. Finish up with a big guy in the back. Hey, Coach, uh, I have two questions for you. My uh, first question is, uh, in your time here, who's been your favorite walk-on? Not you. <laughs> no, actually, Ken, it is you. You know why? Every day when we get ready to uh, do something in practice, Kent will say to me, Coach, how much on this shot? And I would start it out 100 bucks, And then he would miss. I'd say, double or nothing. He would say, okay, just so you know, I'm up to about $35,000 with him. And my question is, when are you going to pay me? You know? My second question is, who, who – uh, Who's your pick for the Masters this weekend? Well, you know what? Uh, for, I want to go back to the first question about our walk-ons. Our, our walk-ons are such a huge part of our program. Like we're trying right now. I mean, our scout team and what uh, and and what we want with our walk-ons. And I, and I and I promise you this: if you ask Kent this question, do we treat him any different uh, than our players? We don't. I mean, I hold him to a high standard. Uh, and he comes in every day ready to go do what he needs to do. Isaiah does. Uh, I mean, I go down a lot. We've had, we've had some terrific walk-ons here, but they're really important to our, our program. And uh, I guess, uh, you know, while I was at Texas, two players that I got to meet when they were seventh and eighth grades were Scotty Scheffler and, uh, and uh, Jordan. And, uh, you know, uh, but sentimentally, I think I'm pulling for Tiger Woods. Because I think back, I had a book one day, I had a book that winners never quit and quitters never win. That was written way back in the 60s. And I remember the story written about Ken Venturi, who was a guy that had a really tough, uh, really bad automobile accident. Great player, you all, you know, he, he was a guy. And, and I think he came back after that accident. He, he won. I don't know if he won a major, but he, he won a big tournament, which they thought was just a heroic, historic event that he were able to come back. and. I'd like to see, you know, Tiger do it and, and, and see if he could do it. But uh, uh, Jordan Speed and Scotty Sheffler, guys I know, I mean, obviously they uh, – and I knew them when they were real young. But um, I'd like to see Tiger get it done. All right, Coach, thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you.